are taking a look at current events, what's been happening lately, and uh, for all of you who've been following it, uh, you realize the National Commission report got issued yesterday. We'll briefly discuss that, but only very briefly, because that's not really the mainstream of our topic today. We want to look at regulatory requirements, uh, then focus on the various techniques available to help you with getting your hazards analysis done, focusing on the facility level hazards analysis, and then uh, Esther Brawley will be covering a, a key topic associated with job safety analyses. Um, it's kind of an unusual element associated with these SEMS hazards analysis requirements, the fact that you've got to do both the facility level and also the job safety analysis. We'll be getting more into that. I want to go over briefly API standards and guidebooks, uh, looking at other analysis techniques and how it all fits together. There's a lot of te techniques out there, some that are required by regulation, some that are required as part of prudent design and put, uh, installing HIPS or SIS systems. And I want to show you how all those things fit together so you can put together an effective program that's uh, also very efficient and well-focused. Uh, then I want to take a look at similarities and differences with other uh, hazards analysis requirements for other safety management systems, and then talk to you about practical approaches, how to get this done effectively. And then at the very end, and you've already got written copies of this, I want to point out various references and resources that you have available to you. So let's talk about first what's been happening lately. Uh, the mainstream of the activity, again, we're going to be focusing on uh, safety environmental management system hazards analysis requirements. Uh, these were published in the Federal Register on October 15th as 30 CFR Part 250, uh, became effective November 15th last year. Um, the holidays were pretty quiet, and basically everybody's starting to get uh, uh, revved up again. And uh, just at the beginning of the year, uh, last Monday, January 3rd, uh, BOEMRE issued a clarification to 13 companies that provide them with some relief from the moratorium in terms of getting back into business and getting their facilities operational. Uh, there is a pre-release, um, I mentioned the National Commission before, a pre-release um, on January 6th of some of the findings. The full release and final report came out yesterday morning. And in fact, today they're still uh, hold, they're holding another forum in New Orleans. Uh, the National Commission report, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we're going to be focusing on hazards analysis requirements, but I did want to bring those of you who haven't been following this up to date real briefly. It was the National Commission. It was formed by the President uh, May 22nd last year, and it was meant to be focused on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and off offshore drilling uh, issues in general for United States waters. Their main purpose was to look at the facts and circumstances behind the, uh, the tragedy, look at options for guarding against future oil spills, and also uh, their objective was to get a final report to the President within six months, but it um, just came out recently, so we're, we're we're getting there. Um, the, uh, again, I haven't uh, had time to really go through the whole thing, and I know there's a lot of contentious issues there. But the one thing I did want to bring up as an excerpt is that um, consistent with a lot of the thinking behind why SEMS came about and the importance of hazards analysis, uh, one of the key issues that's coming out of that is management issues, uh, more specifically management systems. Uh, management systems that control the actions of employees, uh, through procedures, mechanical integrity programs, uh, understanding hazards and having accurate information, and also management actions and decision making. A lot of that's coming, coming out, and there's a, a, a uniform consistency between the driving forces for what led to the SEMS regulations and other safety management systems regulations, and they all focus around uh, management systems issues. So that's where SEMS is coming from. And that's why we're discussing the hazards analysis requirement. So let's look more specifically at the regulatory requirements. As I mentioned, uh, safety and environmental management systems is a requirement for offshore facilities uh, on the uh, U.S. Continental, uh, uh, outer continental shelf under the jurisdiction of the BOEMRE. Uh, like most safety management systems, it's got a number of different elements that are focused on, on very, controlling various actions that are associated with safety and also, in this case, environmental management uh, for various process facilities or facilities considered highly hazardous. Uh, the items in red are those items. Um, I'll just go through the whole elements real quickly, I guess. You've got um, the safety environmental information, very important foundation for understanding the facility and various safety parameters, hazards analysis, which we're going to be focusing on today, management of change, operating procedures, safe work practices, training, 
mechanical integrity, pre-startup review, emergency response and control, investigation of incidents, uh, auditing the, the implementation of the various elements, and also uh, documentation and record keeping, and, and making that available uh, to employees who need that kind of information. The uh, circles in red are those items that people typically have encountered difficulties with implementing before and are considered some of the more important elements of any safety management system. Hazards analysis, management of change, operating procedures, and mechanical integrity. Uh, our December 14th webinar focused on mechanical integrity. Today, we're going to be focusing on hazards analysis. And again, one of the key elements behind uh, any safety management system for a hazards facility and certainly for SEMS. Um, what are the key objectives? Well, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the history and background for this, uh, API Recommended Practice 75 has been in existence um, pro providing guidelines for a SEMPA program for some time. The SEMS regulatory requirements uh, that were published on October 15th basically picked up on that and made that a stepping stone or a foundation for their hazards analysis requirements for the SEMS program. Uh, it established uh, key objectives for the hazards analysis, identifying hazards, making sure they were properly evaluated, controlling them, and also making sure that human factors was properly considered. That's something that hadn't been addressed well in, in the or original safety management systems for other types of facilities like onshore facilities. And in fact, the job safety analysis provision in the uh, requirements of uh, 250.1911 uh, do have a special provision for JSA that help emphasize and provide additional ability to understand and control issues associated with human factors. Um, also, recommended practice 75, uh, I provided a link to uh, various analysis techniques that were identified in greater detail in recommended practice 14J, and also um, uh, identified that you should pick techniques based on facility complexity and the kind of risk posed to the facility. We'll be talking more about that and the kind of techniques you might want to pick for certain applications shortly. Uh, also, recommended practice 75 had some uh, stipulation and guidance for team composition to make sure that the hazards analysis was done uh, with, with the, and to get the kind of information you want to get from it. All right, so um, the SEMS regulations when they came out, uh, 250.1911 provided additional clarifications on how to do the hazards analysis. First of all, it was what they wanted to make sure it was very clear what facilities were being discussed. These are listed here, but basically it covers a lot, all the key offshore facilities that, any, that might represent a potential hazard to personnel or to the environment. It also covered DOI regulated pipelines, and it specifically stated what kind of facilities that you're supposed to apply hazards analysis to. Uh, the two types of requirements, as I mentioned before, were a facility level hazards analysis and also a job safety analysis, and the JSA applying more at the operations or task level. Other clarifications provided by uh, Section 1911 were that you want to maintain the analysis and documentation for the life of the facility. Um, you can make use of um, similarity of systems to do one hazards analysis that encompasses many different facilities or types of systems that are similar, as long as you understand the differences and properly accommodate those differences or even extend the analysis. Uh, the hazards analysis, like many of the, like all these SIMS elements, it must be completed by November 15, 2011. Uh, that gives us about 10 months left. Uh, the hazards analysis also has to be periodically updated. And one of the interesting provisions is that it's supposed to be updated at the same time as the, the performance of the compliance audits. Uh, when looking at the JSAs, JSAs must be completed or approved prior to the commencement of work. So let's take a look at a little bit more about the techniques that they're requiring. Again, there's a, there's a link to, to Recommended Practice 75 and 14J. And um, 1911 in Section A specifically states that you want to pick a technique that's appropriate for the complexity of the operation it's got to properly identify, evaluate, and meet those, all those objectives, and it's got to be consistent with the hazards of the operation. 14J, well, 14, um, uh, the uh, uh, recommended practice 75 and also the 14J also want to push you in the same direction. There's a variety of techniques out there that are listed, and you want to look at those techniques and pick the one that's most appropriate for your application. What if studies, checklists, hazard and operability studies, 
failure modes and effects analysis, fault tree analysis, and other methodologies are acceptable, and different methodologies would apply to different facilities, different circumstances, and different modes of operation, again, uh, pivoting on the complexity and the hazards of the operation. And for a, a very extensive hazards analysis, you may even want to use a mix of techniques to utilize the unique characteristics of that to get the information that you want. Uh, other information about the techniques is you want to make sure that you address the hazards, look at previous incidents, engineering and administrative controls that are your barrier between an event starting and a, the consequences of that event, making sure that you understand the consequences. Now, there's no requirement to do extensive quantitative evaluations of oil spills, how, uh, what, the, what the release extent is, um, the, the specific explosion potentials, or go through a lot of computational fluid dynamics for various types of consequences, as long as they're properly understood to the magnitude and you can deduce from that, are the safeguards adequate? So your whole objective of doing this hazards analysis is to understand the hazards, properly evaluate them, and then establish mechanisms, verify that your mechanisms for controlling the hazard are adequate. And like I mentioned, human factors are also addressed by your JSA in a lot more detail, and we're going to be talking about how you integrate those two, those two hazards analysis elements. Uh, there's also a requirement for developing a system to properly address team findings and recommendations. Uh, that's a critical element if you're identifying deficiencies associated with the hazards analysis. Those deficiencies need to have, um, they may need to have actions associated with them, and you might want to go through and have a program to make sure those actions get implemented properly. Another key objective is quality. That's one of the things we're not going to, we're mostly going over regulatory requirements and some basic techniques today. Using those techniques is a whole subject unto its own. Uh, I'll be providing you with links at the end of the presentation. Uh, we actually have a free webinar series on uh, facilitating process hazard analysis, that there's a lot of information out there. It's a very complex topic. There's a lot of depth to it. But regardless of how you approach it, the main objective is to, it's not just to do the job, just to do the job from the regulatory perspective, but also to do quality efforts so you're properly adhering to the safety and environmental um, responsibilities that you've got by operating offshore facilities. Uh, a key element for achieving that quality objective is having the right folks on the team. And certain elements of the team and who's going to participate are, spe are specifically spelled out by SEMS and also by Recommended Practice 14J. Uh, and also recommended practice 75. The team must have representatives from engineering to understand the design, from operations to understand how it's operated, and also you can bring in other specialties as needed. You also want to include somebody with experience and knowledge for the specific process being evaluated. It's not enough to just bring in a off-the-shelf engineer who doesn't have any background for the facility. That person needs to understand the design, understand what happens if things aren't going well and you're uh, having valves failing open, compressors not working, et cetera, and what the impact on the system is. Uh, you also have to have somebody with experience and knowledge in the hazards assessment methodology itself. That's the way you formulate a team that gets the job done and meets your quality objectives. Now, the direct requirement for both a facility level hazards analysis and also a JSA is rather unique for the, SEM, the SEMS approach. Uh, again, the, the pivotal issue is there's a lot of things that go on on offshore facilities that are very much dependent on specific actions that are taken by personnel. The JSA is designed to look at those human factors issues and, um, and make sure that you've properly evaluated those uh, and that you can maintain the safety and environmental responsibilities that you've got. Uh, most of the most recent JSA must be kept at the job site and must be readily accessible to employees. And also the JSA must identify, analyze, and record job steps, existing or potential safety and health hazards, and also recommended actions or procedures to eliminate or reduce those hazards to an acceptable level. Also for a JSA, a person in charge uh, and a person in, of responsibility must approve the JSA prior to the commencement of work. So what we've done is we've looked at the basic requirements in SEMS, where they come from, and a lot of the nuances that control your facility level hazards analysis and also the JSA. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about the techniques, uh, starting with the facility level hazards analysis. 
some of the common elements for all these techniques, as we discussed, where you want to identify hazards, uh, look at the potential risk to life, health, environment, and property, make sure you understand the consequences and list them out properly documented, identify what safeguards are in place, those barriers between your initiating event and those consequences that you want to avoid, and all hazardous analysis must have uh, provide an objective method to measure the effectiveness of the safeguards and identify the need for additional features, which may come out in the form of recommended actions. So all these are common elements to all the hazards analyses that all the techniques that are out there and all the ones that are specifically listed in 14J as reasonable mechanisms for looking at hazards analyses for offshore facilities. Uh, this chart is a spectrum, there's a spectrum of, of tools out there for uh, performing the hazards analysis, from the very simple checklist and what ifs to the more complex uh, HAZOP study, LOPA, and things that you probably won't encounter, such as event tree analysis and fault tree analysis. All, all these different techniques have their place, depending on the complexity of the system, the type of operation you're doing, what your objectives are, and if you're in the design mode where you're trying to interface uh, your, your hazard analysis with the selection of the appropriate HIPS or SIS features, different techniques may have different value. So for, for the uh, less critical, more simple uh, facilities, you can spend less effort with the checklist or what-if approach. For things that are more complex, where the, the scenarios may be more complex, the facilities may be more complex, the risks may be higher, or you want to integrate the, those, so that scenario-based assessment into your design and LOPA, HIPS system, and SIS selection, you may want to be using something like a hands-up study. So there's a whole spectrum of techniques out there, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, some of the characteristics. Uh, what if checklist, as I mentioned, it's one of the simpler techniques, very straightforward. Um, it's, it's structured, but it can be rather idea restrictive, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you're not as likely to go outside the box and look at new potential hazards. It is easier to use than a lot of the other techniques. It's, it's faster. It's on the simpler end of the spectrum. Uh, you don't need as many resource requirements. Um, you, using it may, and thinking that you've done a thorough job in terms of thinking outside the box, might provide a little bit of a false uh, sense of security. And it may be used better at an early stage of the project. One of the things that has been recommended about the what-if and checklist approaches is that in uh, 14J, they do recommend that there are for simple systems that are easily characterized and, and may be very similar to processes that you've looked at before. Um, you can use checklists, but they don't provide a creative format for identifying or evaluating new hazards where previous experience is lacking. So if you've got a new application, a new environment for your offshore facility, more complex systems, newer systems, uh, things that you don't have an experience base for, a checklist might not be the kind of approach that you want to use. Uh, another technique that's out there, as I mentioned, is a hazard and operability study. That's considered more, a more complicated technique. It does require more effort. It's considered a deductive method, something where you can start from scratch, go outside the box, and maybe find new hazards or insights that you haven't already previous, previously encountered. If it's used properly and facilitated properly, we do a lot of those. And also, we're running that webinar that I mentioned on, on how to facilitate HAZOP studies. If they're kept focused and if they're done properly and facilitated well, they can be very effective and they can provide a lot of value. But again, it's like, it's like any tool. If it's misused, it can also uh, be a real mess in terms of not providing you what you want and also burning a lot of time of some very important people on the team. Uh, HAZOP studies are very comprehensive. Uh, you can build on them very easily because they are based on specific scenarios. If you have a, a minor change in the process that you're looking at from a management of change perspective, you don't necessarily have to go through the whole study. You can focus on specific areas where those scenarios apply. And as I mentioned, it can be a launching point for fault tree analysis, LOPA, and other quantitative techniques. Another technique that's out there that isn't used a lot is um, uh, failure modes and effects analysis. And FMECA is a term sometimes used for when you're, when you're risk ranking it for failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis. It's inductive. It does look at single failures very well. It is straightforward. Uh, but for a, a process facility, it's not often used. 
So let's talk about typical applications. As I mentioned, there's a whole spectrum of these techniques out there, uh, from the very simple to the more complex. And um, the very simple end of it with respect to what-if checklists are appropriate if it's a known type of system you've used before, it's in the same kind of environment, with the same kind of materials you've used before, and you've got a good operational base, that can be a very effective technique. For things that involve more processing, higher risks, or you want to do more with it, such as, such as make choices, uh, establish SIL levels, make choices on SIS or HIPS instrumentation, things like a hazard and operability study, and maybe even coupling it with a layer of protection analysis may be more appropriate. And I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, regardless of what technique you use, uh, it's, it's one of the pivotal issues with respect to quality is having good information. Uh, accurate safety and environmental information, SEI is one of the uh, SEMS, mo uh, SEMS uh, elements, but having accurate safety and environmental information is critical towards the outcome of a good quality hazards analysis. The, pivot, the key point of that is that your um, core point that you're focusing on is usually PNIDs or piping instrumentation diagrams that are up to date, verified to be current with the, with the design. Uh, having process flow diagrams with that is also a high priority item that is very useful. Having site, site layout, platform location drawings, very important. Any previous incidents or accidents that apply to your system. It may be on the particular facility you're evaluating, or it may be at another very similar facility that applies to what you're doing. Those are, can also be very useful. Management change, PSSR, pre-start safety review documentation, and also the implementation status of previous recommendations. Those are all very useful elements for getting a good start and doing a good quality hazards analysis. So let's take a look at an example for one so we know what we're talking about. The main objective, and I'll just uh, show you some quick examples of a hazard and operability study to provide you with a framework for the hazards analysis. What you're trying to do, what you see on the screen is a very simple uh, diagram of a high pressure vessel on level control uh, going to a low pressure system. Uh, very simple process. Uh, it's basically a snapshot of what might be in your, uh, on one of your PNIDs, but it's a functional representation for how the system works. The whole idea for hazards analysis, regardless of the technique you're using, is you're trying to translate that understanding of how it operates, how it works, how it functions, into how does it fail? How can it break? How can something go wrong so that, so that people get hurt, it has an environmental impact, or it damages the facility? And once you understand that, you can identify if the safety features, those barriers, those safeguards in place are adequate, or whether they need to be improved. So the whole game is translating that understanding of operations and that operational representation into an understanding of what can go wrong, what can fail, and how do you stop it. So you go from that functional representation, the key basis for a HAZOP study is you make a fundamental assumption that with you, when you're operating within your design envelope, you've got a minimal potential for HAZOP. So whether it be a hazard operability study or one of the other techniques, you're looking at going beyond that boundary of normal operation or normal design parameters. What happens if you go outside that design envelope? And then you ask yourself, is it adequate? For a HAZOP study, you approach it using a deviation matrix where you combine uh, design parameters uh, with, um, I'm sorry, various parameter guide words with design conditions to get deviations where you look at and identify particular scenarios that can go wrong at a facility. Once you identify those scenarios, you cycle through the whole facility, looking at all scenarios, clearly identifying uh, the causal events, your safety features in place, what are the consequences, cycle through the whole system, and then, then you've come out, what comes out of that is, are there any weaknesses that you need to address? So what you're doing is you're translating that functional understanding, and this is a typical representation of the documentation for a HAZOP study that typically goes into a table. So how do you approach all this? With the facility level hazards analysis, um, with the job safety analysis, can be a lot of potential overlap. Well, a lot of that's by design. Again, the JSA is, is more uh, keen towards looking at operational issues that are, are very much hands-on, where there are various steps associated with somebody doing something. The facility level hazards analysis is more associated with the process. 
So how are you kind of combining those two, and how can you combine them sensibly? What we typically recommend is getting the facility level hazards analysis done first. It's a team approach. You're going to get, it's going to force you to get all the design information together, have a really good understanding of, of how the system works, and to punch through all the key scenarios that can lead to deviations outside your design envelope and potential consequences that you may want to avoid. Um, you want to use a technique appropriate to the complexity of the operation for that facility level hazards analysis. Once you're done with that, you can use a subset of that team for some, the JSA, which is typically, as it's applied, a little bit less complicated. And you can use the operating procedures as the core of that JSA evaluation. However, if you've got people on the same from the same team as you use for your facility level hazards analysis and have that documentation completed and available to that team, you can identify uh, those areas that you've already evaluated and don't need to redo with the JSA and can then simply review it and, and reference it. So that's, that's our suggestion for an approach that, that addresses the requirements and makes good use of your team expertise and everybody's time and to do a thorough approach. So to talk more about the job safety analysis uh, approach, what the requirements are and how to go about it effectively, what I'd like to do is, is uh, bring up to the podium uh, Esther Brawley. Uh, she's a, a key engineer on our team. Uh, she's, her background is with the uh, California Maritime Academy, graduating as an engineer. She's been on our team for quite a few years and has done a number of hazards analyses for a wide spectrum of facilities, both onshore and offshore. So I'll turn it over to Esther. Is that all right? All right, so we're going to talk about the job safety analysis. So as Steve was saying earlier, this is a little bit different for the offshore arena. Um, this isn't really an explicit requirement for uh, onshore safety management systems. So it's basically been an industry best practice. Um, pretty much every company implements this. However, it's never, this is the first time it's going to be a specific regulatory requirement. Um, we have the regulations up there, so it's the 250.1911B. Um, not a lot of detail there, not a lot of guidance. Um, however, there is uh, ample examples of people not properly implementing JSA that have come out of extensive incident investigations that have been conducted by Bomer, formerly MMS, over the years. So if you really are trying to understand how to tackle this um, and be compliant, uh, you are subject to kind of, you know, the standard deviation of your industry and um, keeping up with best practices. So I, I really do suggest that you look at those investigations. We're going to summarize some of them at the end here. So obviously they need to be readily accessible. All activities in your SEMS program. So you need to start with a baseline of all of your operations, maintenance procedures that you have documented as part of your SEMS program. Uh, some people right now, some of our, even some of our clients, uh, that's, that in and of itself is a huge undertaking. Um, because what use is a JSA on an operating procedure that's irrelevant and outdated? So that's probably your first priority, is to make sure you have a good baseline there to do your initial JSAs on. Now at that point, you have a library of JSAs upon which you can build on when a procedure is, going to, is deviate, the conditions deviate, the weather, uh, people, maybe you're using a new contractor, um, whatever the case, deviate from an existing procedure, or it's a little bit outside the box, you're supposed to reevaluate it with your team um, before that job is done or the task, or maybe every morning as part of your morning meeting. So what is a job safety analysis? Um, there's another tool out there called that's pretty known in, in all kinds of industry sectors called job hazard analysis. Um, this is not to be confused with job hazard analysis. This is a job safety analysis looking at specific procedures and their tasks. So basically what you're doing is you're taking, okay, we're going to do a job where we have a certain operation at hand. We've got this contractor, we've got our operators, or maybe it's just your operations and maintenance personnel, whatever the case. And you're going to get together, you're going to look at the specific task. Um, 
So it can't really be vague operations. I mean, it has to be specific tasks. You're going to list the steps. Then you're going to look at the hazards, the worst case hazards associated with each step. And then you're going to say, what are our controls that we have in place to make sure what this worst case hazard is not going to be met? These could be things like confined space entry, you know, fire watch, lockout, tag out, P obviously PPE, um, just different controls and mechanisms you're going to have to have in place. Now, a fourth requirement isn't necessarily specifically laid out in the FEMS rule, but is a best practice is responsibility. Having that fourth column for, okay, who's responsible for making sure this control is done and done appropriately and is monitoring this? Um, so you want to assign responsibility because um, later on when we look at some incident investigations, you'll see where the lack of assigning responsibility led to um, failures and, and fatalities or serious injuries. So just to summarize what you have on the screen, obviously integrate safety and health principles has to identify each basic step of a job and the hazards associated with that step. Um, obviously include environmental equipment hazards. An interesting thing has come out is weather conditions. You know, some people might not think to, um, you might need to revisit a JSA, a previous JSA, if you expect some um, abnormal weather conditions that could impact the job. So things like this you have to reevaluate. Obviously you list the safety measures, controls, procedures in place to mitigate those hazards associated with the job, with the job task. Um, obviously you want to be used to determine the safest way to perform a certain task. Um, special operations, operations performed by contractors, you have to do a JSA prior to commencing work. Um, you have to have everybody, all the participants there, open communication. The point is the process, the thinking, the, the, the thinking behind it, getting everybody thinking. This isn't about, you know, going through a checklist as fast as possible. Um, and then one thing, too, is if you're working with a contractor, you guys need to compare your, your individual JSA standards. You have to follow the one that's the most stringent. So whoever company, whichever company has the most stringent JSA policy, that is the one that needs to be followed. And then, of course, each day tower meeting, you need to include the JSA. Um, one trap, though, that the day-to-day -day stuff can fall into is that the operators get in a habit of, of doing things kind of after the fact. Like, they know of the hazards because they've happened before or they had a near miss or somebody else had this incident occur, somebody got hurt, and so they're able to really readily identify those hazards. But you're also supposed to be kind of looking outside the box and looking for things that maybe could happen, but thank God, you know, haven't, and, and making sure you have controls in place for that. So obviously there's a lot of benefits of a JSA. Um, people have been doing this for decades. This isn't, you know, a new science. Um, I think there's a little bit of a lack of consistency in industry, different people doing different things, um, but it has been around for quite a long time. So obviously you want to discuss the path with the group of experienced workers. Um, you also probably want to step back for a second and just look at the general conditions of this job. Um, for instance, general lockout, tagout, machinery issues, um, electrical hazards at the job site you know, like general job site hazards, you know, objects falling, making sure that the area is, you know, kept um, roped off so that unsuspecting workers don't wander off in there, making sure your tools are accessible to where workers don't have to travel into the unsafe zone to get the important tool or the important PPE. They have access to it in a safe manner. Um, obviously, harnesses and things. Um, so you want to look at the general job site, and then you obviously want to look at, you have to look at the specific tasks and then specific hazards to each task. You need to document it. It has to be written, and everybody has to sign it before you commence the work. Um, there's actually been, there's a lot of situations where people have a verbal JSA, and it's not written and documented um, until after an accident occurs. Um, so you really have to be strict about getting this done in writing. Everybody signs off that they were there, participated before commencing work. 
Um, it's, the best part about it is it increases the communication amongst the team. Everybody's on the same page. We know what the chain of command is, who's in charge of what. Um, there's no chaos, uh, which can oftentimes is what leads to accidents. And it strengthens the overall safety culture among facility personnel. So now this is a, this is a regulator, regulatory requirement. So you're kind of in a whole new realm here. Employee participation. It's supposed to be, you know, a communication loop. Um, it's not so much about this supervisor or this guy with 30 years experience dictating to everybody else and they just don't really speak up or don't contribute their insights or, or things they've noticed that are maybe hazardous. You know, it's about a loop of information and employee participation. And as a company, you've got to um, change up your safety culture and encourage that. Okay, so these are the four basic steps to a JSA. Selecting the job, breaking the job down into the steps, identifying the hazards for each step, and then identifying the preventive measures or controls in place to prevent the hazards. And then you probably want to add another column to assign responsibility. Assign somebody who's responsible for making sure that control is implemented. This is just a couple of examples of forms. I'm sure everybody out there has their own form because, like I said, this has been implemented for decades. Um, so I highly recommend the fourth column, though, of assigning responsibility. Um, because nine times out of ten, the controls aren't properly implemented because, you know, he thinks that person's doing it and that person thinks the contractor's doing it the contractor thought you were doing it. And, and so you good to just assign responsibilities with everybody there, all the key players there, and you're all in agreement. Here's another example, a little bit more detailed, and this involves a risk matrix, too. Um, what's nice about involving in risk matrix is sometimes, especially when people do a certain operation over and over and over again, it's like second hand to them, um, they're, they're just automatically ruling out certain hazards because they say, oh, that's so improbable. Oh, that's so unlikely it's not even worth talking about. So what's nice about doing a risk matrix, quick, you know, just a quick risk matrix, taking it out of their hands and keeping an objective. Okay, well, who cares how probable it is or isn't? What's the worst case hazard? And just assigning the severity. And then if you do have a high severity task that could result, let's say, in a fatality, um, it really makes the team scrutinize the controls that are in place to make sure that worst case fatality is not realized. Um, so that's what's nice about incorporating the risk assessment uh, column into your JSA because it, it makes it a little bit more objective. So I'm not going to go through all these or read them. The point of this, and this is in your handout, so you can read them later, is to kind of show you how these are safety alerts that were issued by the Gulf of Mexico Outer Continental Shelf. Um, over the last five years, that all every single one of these involved either a breakdown of the JSA, uh, and there was a recommendation by MMS on how to properly implement JSA. Um, I think this is one of the best references you can do to figure out maybe your company is going to go. Okay, um, this might give you some ideas on maybe vulnerabilities that your company is experiencing so that you can maybe prevent them. Um, one thing that's nice about JSAs, and I really recommend as a corporation, if you're trying to figure out ways to encourage safety, the safety culture of your organization and grade the safety culture, um, a lot of my clients, I feel, have a very strong safety culture as a corporation. Um, you know, and what that means to me is that everything isn't put on this one safety guy, and he's supposed to, or she's supposed to accomplish everything. It, that's just that system is going to fail. Um, the only way this these the STEM program is going to succeed is it has to be um, multidisciplinary, uh, top to bottom in your organization. Um, everybody's involved. Everybody's aware. Um, that's why there's an employee participation element of STEM and other onshore safety management systems like process safety management. 
um, you know, what a lot of people do is they look at the completeness of JSA, and they use that as a grading tool for different uh, supervisors or different, uh, like, say, platforms or facilities. So if you find that um, a huge percentage of the JSAs either weren't filled out properly, weren't done, um, you can use that as a grading it tool and assign that grade to that facility and to those supervisors. Uh, same thing with recommendations from hazard analysis. A lot of companies use that as their grading tool. How long did it take you to close out your recommendation or just address it? Um, how long did it take you to put that recommendation into the database and then follow up with it? Um, so those are tools that uh, management who maybe have are very far removed from operations can use to grade their facility um, and company safety culture. So there's a common thread in these JSAs. And um, I'm just going to scroll through them. They're in your handout. Uh, and if you don't have a handout, we can re-email it to you. And, and these are also posted online. So these were all issued from the MMS, now Bomer. Um, and these, this is ex explicit wording and statements from MMS on these specific incidents. So here's some key points. These are the kind of the lessons learned. So it has to be conducted to identify all potential hazards, consequences, necessary mitigations, precautions. Um, you have to be, uh, you need to give special consideration to obviously releasing ignition sources. So the JSA uh, should be used to review site-specific detailed job sets and uncover their hazards. You can build on an existing JSA, but it's recommended that you at least review it with the team slowly to make sure that, yes, these steps and these hazards and these controls are applicable to our job at hand or the operation we're getting ready to commence. Um, obviously, site-specific JSA should be conducted to accurately reflect the job at hand. So when the scope changes, you need to redo your JSA. Um, these verbal pre-job safety meetings, obviously that is a component of the JSA, but it needs to be written. Um, this is a common breakdown where the written JSA form was not completed and signed by all, all parties until after an accident occurred or near miss. Um, and then obviously, uh, this is what most operators seem to have in their policies. Now, whether they are following it is another story, but most operators have an HSB policy that requires a written JSA and pre-job safety meeting before a new job, beginning of each workday, and in the event of a significant operational change. That operational change can be people, flow rate, uh, weather changes, environmental conditions, uh, whatever the case. So you need to critically consider that. These are some examples of where people made mistakes. It was vague, not specific. Um, it didn't include important steps. They just kind of hit key points, but they didn't look at each step. Um, they didn't address the tasks of the specific job functions individually. Um, lack of communication and coordination of the tasks between, you know, the different parties. And um, you need to make assignment and responsibilities clear. Um, if you identify the control that's in place, kind of useless if you haven't assigned somebody responsible for making sure that control is implemented to prevent the hazard. Supervisors should always hold a fully attended, comprehensive JSA meeting prior to major operations. They need to address all the steps in the upcoming operation, not just the major elements. All supervisors have a responsibility of communicating and understanding the unambiguous chain of command during upcoming operations. That is a quote from MMS, now Bomer, in one of their incident investigations. Um, so that's where they are coming from. So if you're looking for a little bit more insight to what they mean by this JSA requirement, uh, the best thing to do is look at past this incidents and learn from them. So obviously you have to have a formal review process. So what I've noticed, I mean, you'll see those tables. That was only just the last five years' worth of incidents that had a breakdown in the JSA component as one of the key root causes for the incident. Um, I think it's just all over the place. Everybody's doing something different. Um, and sometimes 
maybe the operators or the supervisor isn't sure, it's not completely clear that they're required to do a JSA for that specific operation. So the company should really have some key guidelines, um, maybe give them some tips on some questions that they can ask. Um, to like, you know, give them ideas for questions to ask, like a minimum set of questions to ask when they're evaluating each task, and then obviously, uh, you know, get the team input on any additional hazards that they know of based on their experience. Um, but you'd want to say, okay, you know, are the hazards requiring the use of personal protective clothing and equipment that are appropriate for the job? You know, ask questions like, are work positions, machinery, pit poles, hazardous operations adequately guarded? Are lockout per tagout procedures used or been implemented or required? Um, you know, what kind of, are there any fixed objects, sharp edges that can cause injuries? Are there falling hazards? Um, can a worker get caught in or between moving parts? Can the worker be injured by reaching over moving machinery parts and materials? So maybe put together a list of, a set list of questions to help guide the team leader of the JSA. Um, a minimum set of questions, and obviously we want to get input from the experience of the team. This is a quote that the lessees are reminded that site-specific pre-job planning, JSA, safety meetings, et cetera, and open communications are critical elements for the successful outcome of all job tasks. So that is a finding from Bomer in regards to JSA. And um, just operators ensure that experience and accountable supervision is supplied by all contractor crews. So now we're going to go into API standards and guidebooks. I'm going to give you back to Mr. Marr, and he will also give you some insights onto uh, LOPA. Mr. Marr, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, Michael. You're Michael? Uh, I thought about Oh, no, that's, I, I'm good to go. And uh, I'm coming through okay, Nicole? Yeah. Okay, great. Esther, thank you. And um, before I get into API standards and guidebooks, let me put a little perspective on where we're at. Earlier I was reviewing the requirements, the stated guidebooks, the kinds of specific techniques that are required by the recommended practice 75 that uh, is the stepping stone for the sense requirements and the affiliated recommendation, uh, uh, recommended practices and guidebooks. What I want to talk about is several other elements out there that you may have heard or are likely to hear and I want to illustrate how those fit into the big picture here. So first of all, API standards and guidebooks. We've talked about API recommended practice 75 being a stepping stone for SIMS. It is the uh, key item that's referenced and was used in its formulation. Uh, it's been through several editions, last one being 2004, and there's been a lot of discussion as of late about additional upgrades to accommodate more extreme uh, offshore applications, newer equipment that's coming to play, and any of those are at the discussion phase right now. For right now, you've got Recommended Practice 750, 775, third edition 2004 as that basis for SEMS and as a key reference point. Other things to hear about or see referenced are Recommended Practice 14C. 14C is focused on design, installation, and testing of basic safety systems for production platforms. Uh, it talks about uh, component configurations, how, how you generate process flow diagrams, what should be in them, PNIDs, and all the various features associated with key safety systems. There's also some very good diagrams in there that illustrate uh, overall layout and recommended levels of protection for various configurations in common applications for offshore platforms. Uh, they also focus quite a bit on safe charts. So 14C is out there. Um, You'll have to gauge its applicability to the systems that you're currently working with. And as I said, there's been some discussion about a need for an update. Uh, 14J is specifically referenced by uh, Recommend Practice 75, which is, of course, then subsumed into, into uh, the SEMS requirements. Uh, 14J talks about design and hazards analysis for production facilities. And also, it's talking about um, how to formulate safety environmental information and how to do the hazards analysis, and a little bit more detail about acceptable techniques and what's out there. So those are key API recommended practices. And also, uh, the American Petroleum Institute has um, done a lot of good things recently because of uh, a, a lot of these references are key part of your safety programs. 
they've uh, taken some steps to make these uh, recommended practices more accessible to everybody without having to get a subscription or actually pay for it. Uh, they have a provision on their website, and I've got the reference in the back of this document, for taking a look at a read-only copies in an online interface. Uh, let's talk about other safety management systems and other analysis techniques. Um, one of the things that, that is a common thread here, and I didn't want to get into this when we were talking about specific requirements, but for all safety management systems, what you're trying to do, especially when you're looking at hazards analysis, is really understand that the, the, uh, the basis for determining whether something is safe or not safe, whether your safety features are adequate or whether you need to have recommended improvements to design our operations, is really looking at both not just the consequences or how bad things can be, uh, and not just likelihood or how likely, likely something might happen, but really combining the two, looking at both likelihood and consequences to really get a picture of how important specific scenarios uh, and safety, safety systems associated with those scenarios are. The diagram that you're seeing is looking at a variety of different scenarios, one through five. One being low frequency, low consequences. Three being high frequency, low consequences five being high frequency and high consequences. So by looking, uh, risk obviously increases as you go diagonally towards the upper right-hand side, and your, the importance of the scenarios is really a function very clearly of both likelihood and consequences, and you need to understand both. Now, a lot of you have seen that in the form of a risk ranking matrix. Uh, this is one, uh, just a representative one, Again, it's got the same pattern, where higher risk events are in the upper right-hand corner, lower risk events that may be lower likelihood or lower consequences or both are in the lower left-hand side. Whether you're looking at it from a, um, the previous di diagram on the previous page or this risk ranking matrix, you're really trying to get an appreciation for how important scenarios and safety features are so you can do your job by making effective decisions on whether design or operations are adequate. So the techniques that are out there, all the hazards analysis techniques that are cited by the SEMS regulation or other analytical techniques are all designed to give you ideas on and determining the acceptability of the design or operations or whether improvements are needed. They're decision-making tools, all of them. They're all decision-making tools that will help you determine acceptable, unacceptable, or if improvements are needed. Uh, of the tools out there, I mentioned that uh, HAZOP study is often a, uh, um, a jumping off point for more complex quantitative analyses. If you're in the design phase especially, laying out the scenarios in the form of a hazard and operability study where you identify clear causes, what the consequences are, and then the safety, safety features that act as a barrier between that causal event and the consequences, and then ranking it is, is an initial cut at understanding the scenario. Other tools are out there, layer protection analysis, quantitative risk assessment, in order of increasing complexity to help you get a better cut or a better understanding. And those quantitative tools, such as LOPA and QRA, are especially useful if you're trying to make decisions on the reliability of safety features. What does that mean? You've probably heard of a safety instrumented systems or high integrity protection systems, basically SIS or HIPS. Uh, these, are, these make use of high reliability components and the latest developments in, uh, in electronics to bring you more reliable safety devices. Where do you apply them? What kind of um, redundancy do you need? What kind of voting logic might be required? All that can be decided effectively based on the results of these, the application of quantitative techniques. But like any tool, you want to apply them to the extent that it makes sense for the problem and the decision you're trying to make. Uh, just a little bit more about LOPA for your reference. Uh, they, they look at things like quantifying uh, some, some rough cut numbers at quantifying the initiating cause uh, by looking at the independent layers of protection and, uh, and their probability of failure and demand, putting all those together and comparing it to a target frequency of how safe you want it to be for certain types of consequences. That's what goes into a LOPA calculation. Uh, for those of you who haven't dealt with probabilities and, and the like and applying them to failure scenarios, it can be a little scary at first, but 
uh, once uh, it, the the effective application, and especially if it's done in tandem with a HAZOP study, can be very simple and can provide a lot more insights for very little extra work. And again, can be that uh, that segue towards understanding the needed reliability and design features, and of course, cost of your SIS and HIPS systems. Um, already mentioned how those work together, and uh, I also mentioned that. Um, LOPA can help you determine if risk targets are met, the adequacy of your basic pro uh, uh, process control systems, or your SIS or HIPS systems. Uh, you can do uh, benefit cost analysis very easily, um, identify, identify if risk targets are already achieved or can be achieved with these new features, and also identify those reliability targets. Uh, implementation, as I mentioned, it can be very easily easy if you do it right. It can also be very difficult if you um, if you're not familiar with the technique or, or it's applied in, in a redundant fashion where you're kind of redoing work that was already done. So layer protection analysis, very useful tool if it's applied properly and maybe one of those things that you see if you're in part of a design effort or you're trying to determine the reliability of SIS or HIPS features. Another safety management system that's out there uh, is safety cases. Uh, this is a very broad, a safety case isn't one item, it's a very broad range of um, techniques that can be applied. In most cases, I think offshore facilities were one of the first applications because they kind of, uh, re the requirement for that uh, was based in the United, based on the United Kingdom and those areas around there and from the Piper Alpha accident in 1988. So it was really the offshore industry was really the mainstream and first applications of safety cases. A lot of um, uh, potentially hazardous onshore facilities have also seen the application of safety cases. But basically a safety case is simply that. It's a case to be made on whether something is safe or not. How do you do that? There's a whole variety of techniques. But again, the main objective is an appropriate evaluation of the level of safety of the facility. And can a case be made such that it can be operated safely and how you go about doing that. So doing a safety case involves a lot of the hazards analysis and other safety management system techniques that go into SEMS, and that's why it's being discussed right here. As I mentioned, the original requirements were 1992, stemming from the Piper Alpha accident in 1988. Uh, the main focus was on fire risk assessment, uh, ingress of smoke or gas into accommodation areas, for obvious reasons for those of you who are familiar with the Piper Alpha accident and also looking at uh, emergency systems and also evacuation and escape. An update was made in the requirement in 2005 to talk more about the design and also interaction with the regulators. Uh, make sure that there's an update as required uh, and also er at least every five years. And um, uh, also making sure that operators are capable of fulfilling their legal requirements. So there were updates in 2005, but again, and there's a lot of examples out there, especially for mobile offshore drilling units. There's a very good uh, guidebook for that. But again, a safety case is simply a case to be made for if something's safe enough. The various techniques that apply, how, how deep you go into quantitative risk assessment, all that is quite variable. And of course, pivots on the need, the risk, and the complexity of the facility. There we go. Uh, you're looking at a bow tie diagram. I'll get to that in a second. A typical safety case will contain facility description, uh, discussion of management systems for health, safety, and environmental issues, a formal safety assessment, uh, talking about safety critical elements and performance standards, as well as reasonably practical demonstration, such that you're making the case for safety, and also verifying fitness to operate. The bow tie is a typical uh, diagram, diagrammatic representation of going from a various threat or causal event, uh, failure of safeguards to where you actually get a hazardous release or some other type of hazard, and then the sort of things that act as barriers to the kind of consequences that you're trying to avoid. It's a typical diagram diagrammatic representation that goes into safety cases. Uh, and I don't want to get into all these different elements. Most of you will recognize things like hazard approach, hazams, what if studies, hazard operability studies, FMEAs, a lot of things that we've been discussing in terms of hazards analysis techniques, whatever technique is chosen and applied to a safety case is dependent on the complexity and the, what kind of risk is involved with the facility and what sort of information you need to make your safety case. So 
That's not a whole uh, treatise on safety cases. Just wanted to familiarize you with the term, what it's all about, so you can see how that might interfere, uh, interface with your SAMS program and specifically the hazards analysis requirements. Now, what I want to get into is there's also other um, requirements out there, other safety management system requirements out there uh, that, and what I want to talk about is similarities and differences with, uh, with SEMS for reasons that I'll discuss in a few minutes and, and maybe a bit of good news for many of you too. Um, PSM, Process Safety Management, RMP, Risk Management Programs. These are for onshore facilities in the United States and for facilities that are considered highly hazardous. Like SIMS, they have a lot of elements that are associated with safety management systems, things like uh, process safety information, operating procedures, management change. The, if you're familiar with SIMS, looking at a PSM or RMP program is gonna be very familiar to you, and also vice versa. There's, a, there's more similarities and differences for obvious reasons. Managing safety and controlling hazards at facilities there's a common thread whether the facility is offshore, onshore, a lot of the basic premises are the same. I'll show you how you can use that in a few minutes. There's similarities in objectives, the kind of methodologies that, that, you, approach, that you use. In fact, the methodologies that are identified in Recommended Practice 14J for offshore facilities are the same methodologies that are identified as acceptable in PSM and RMP for hazards analysis. Um, the, the choice of methodology, just like for offshore facilities, is uh, commensurate with the complexity and risk. You need to have somebody knowledgeable in the hazard analysis methodology. You need to have somebody knowledgeable in design and operations. You need to retain documentation, and you need to address team findings. Again, whether you're looking at an onshore facility or offshore, if you've identified a potential deficiency that can result in a significant impact to personnel and the environment, that's something that you'll... Um, Want to, uh, want to address promptly, or at least commensurate with the potential risk it poses. Now, the bottom line, and I, I bolded this, is quality. Quality is a function of how good your information is. If you, if you do not uh, have good in, uh, uh, safety information, SEI, coming into your hazards analysis, junk in, junk out. Your hazards analysis is not gonna give you the kind of results that you want, and even more disappointing, your hazards analysis is gonna take a lot longer because you're gonna have a lot of interactive discussion of that team on what, how the design and operations really are. The team, if you grab a random engineer that knows nothing about the facility and a random operator that, has, uh, that hasn't been at that facility and operated it, you're not gonna get information that you want and your hazards analysis will drag on and on. You'll have, get less done with a lot more work. Having the right team there and the right people there is critically important. Facilitator. The methodology I put last, you know, just picking checklists, what if, has up studies, that's only one step in terms of deciding how you're going to do things. Implementing it properly and having somebody who can really push it through there is of critical importance to eventually actually achieving your objectives. That's why whether you're looking at recommended practice 75, SEMS, PSM, or RMP, they recommend having somebody who's familiar with the hazards analysis methodology. So in order of importance, the quality of your uh, results, the value you provide, and efficiency that you get it done is a key factor of uh, envir safety environmental information, the quality of the team, who's on the team, the facilitator, and also last, what methodology you're choosing to make sure it's well matched with the problem at hand. Key unique requirements of SEMS. What makes SEMS different? A big item is the uh, requirement for a supplemental JSA. Uh, that's something that's, that's not uh, specifically addressed for other uh, safety management systems such as PSM and RMP for reasons that offshore facilities are a little different and there's a lot more um, specific operator actions that are done in many cases. And also they, uh, the SIMS program wanted to solve a problem that's kind of been plaguing the application of hazards analysis for PSM and RMP, which is how do you address human factors. Another key difference is the um, when you update it. Obviously you need to update it if you're making major changes to the facility and it may be folded into your uh, management change process. Also if you're changing operations or even uh, company change, management structure, key personnel, all those may be things that you may want to rethink what kind of hazards are out there. 
but there are specific requirements to at least update it at three-year intervals starting on the second year after the initial SIMS program completion. So you've got a little tricky situation here, and it's consistent with, with when audits are done. Well, actually, that's not tricky. Doing the audit and the hazards analysis at the same time is a little bit easier to manage. Cycling it two years initially and then three years every year after, after every time after that is going to be something you're going to want to make sure you build properly into your program. So there are comparing these to other requirements for hazards analysis in PSM and RMP, there are similarities and differences, but mostly similarities. The differences, there's pretty much a reason for those, and there are things that actually if you implement it properly, you can make good use of the unique requirements of SIMS to get things that, that will benefit your personnel and the operation of your facility. So let's talk about some good news and, and also some, some business issues. One of the things that I've been trying to, to press forth here is that the bulk of these elements are common to other loss prevention programs, such as PSM and RMP. So what do you do with that? Well, it's nice to know, but the fact is that if you're a large company and you've got um, technical resources in other business units where you've got teams that are already applying PSM and RMP to onshore facilities, you may have resources already in your company that you can uh, get on board and help you get your, fulfill your November 15th deadlines for SEMS implementation. Uh, there's a lot of contractors, consultants out there. We're, we're one of those. But for large companies that have both onshore and offshore business units, uh, you've got a lot of resources, maybe a lot of resources already at your disposal that can be easily uh, morphed into your needs for the SEMS program. So I think for a lot of you, that's going to be some really good news to help you get the job done, meet the requirements, and make sure that you can get your facilities operating in the manner that's regulatory required and also beneficial to your company. Uh, for your reference, um, you've, I've put together a compliance matrix of uh, these other programs, PSM and RMP. Um, in fact, let me, let me translate real quickly here, too. The uh, column on the right with the EPA, that's the risk management program. Second from the right, OSHA, that's process safety management. And the middle column that's, re that's labeled Recommended Practice 75 and 30 CFR Part 250 uh, with the diagonal slash between, those are the specific sections in Recommended Practice 75 and also the specific uh, clarification uh, sections in Part 250 where you can get information about what the, what the differences are and the specific requirements for SEMS. So hopefully this is a little bit of a handy table for you. And the rest of what I'd like to discuss before we go into the question and answer period, I'd like to spend no more than five minutes. And also, Nicole, um, do you want to invite Esther to come back for the QA period, too? Um, uh, the, uh, the other thing, oh, do you have to leave? Oh, all right. Uh, all right, that'll be fine, that'll be fine. Um, the, for, um, with respect to resources, I just want to let you know this is part of a continuing webinar series on SEMS elements. Uh, the next one is February 10th, and it's going to be covering operating procedures, trying to provide some tips on how to uh, implement them effectively. And in, try, in fact, that's the key uh, mainstream of what we want to do with all these webinars. When roll out the requirements, get information out there, and also provide a forum to provide some tips from our experiences having implemented these things for SEMP and other programs. Um, some other uh, recent webinars, we've already posted videos and presentation materials on our website. I'll give you the address for the website in a few minutes. Uh, we've get, had some really nice overviews, uh, had some guest speakers from uh, State Lands Commission in California, uh, and also provided uh, good overviews of these. And also um, the last one on December 14th was the start of our actual SEM series and focused on mechanical integrity program implementation. Uh, upcoming ones, operating procedures, as I mentioned. March 3rd is safety environmental information. March 29th, uh, practical MIC, MOC approaches. Uh, April 19th, uh, training contractor safety uh, and also implementation of safe work practices. May 12th, uh, emergency action plans. Incident investigation on June 7th. And July 14th is audit requirements and practical approaches towards doing the audits. Um, that one's going to be interesting. There's a lot of very specific uh, SEMS requirements for pre-notification of BOEMRE of your audit plans, and also 
avoiding conflict of interest with the auditor and who you get on your audit team. Uh, for your reference and in your handout, uh, we've got other resources that I've provided uh, links for. The top one is for the DOE MRE for announcements and other clarifications. Uh, SEMS1.com, uh, Risk Management Professionals runs. Uh, it's basically our, our launching site for uh, a lot of information on the SEMS program. Uh, there's a specific link for offshore webinars uh, and, and how you can watch the videos, it's all free. Watch the videos and various topics, what's coming up on, that, on the third bullet from the top. Uh, there's also other training programs out there specifically of interest because of the hazards analysis uh, requirements is our uh, HAZUP study facilitation seminar series. Uh, I got a lot of, been getting a lot of good feedback about that. And it's basically an encapsulation of our, our three-day uh, HAZUP study facilitation training course into different modules. And those are also um, on video that you can watch at your convenience. And also you're welcome to tune in for our next one, which is next week. Um, SEMSresource.com has been, um, we've been trying to compile recent information, useful stuff for folks. Uh, SEMSsolution.com, that's the third one from the bottom. Um, uh, Risk Management Professionals has actually uh, combined forces with a firm that's specialized in providing management, solution, management system software solutions and that we've uh, tweaked it for, to address EMS requirements. So it's meant to be a soup to nuts uh, program to facilitate the implementation of SEMS. Uh, and also the two bottom bullets are some other agencies. The oilspillcommission.gov, you might want to check that if you don't already have a copy of the final report that came out yesterday. It's 390 plus pages. Uh, I haven't reviewed it yet, but if you want a copy, it can be downloaded from the site. And as I also mentioned, in New Orleans today, they're, ha they're having a public, uh, public meeting. Bottom of the page, api.org. Again, I mentioned API has been doing a lot of work, a lot of outreach work to make some of its key safety standards and recommended practices available for previewing on their website. That can be pretty handy for a lot of folks, and, and it's API's interest to get that information out to help uh, everybody's safety programs. And these last two pages are just a whole plethora of different references and background information associated with SIMS and all the different SEMS elements. So right now, I'm good to go for questions. Actually, one of the things I'd, one of the things I'd like to do is there, there is, um, for all of you folks who are responsible for your SEMS programs, uh, in terms of um, performance, OCS performance measures, uh, form MMS-131, I wanted to remind everybody it is January 12th, and as part of these requirements, as part of the SIMS requirements, it, it also envelopes the submittal of that on March 31st of each year, starting on March 31st, 2011. So most of the SIMS requirements are, are, are due on November 15th of 2011, uh, which, by the way, for those of you who haven't started, there's a lot, there can be a lot of work to be done on these if you don't already have a very active SIMP program. Uh, but the, the one early one is the March 31st deadline for the MMS-131 form on performance measures. Very simple. They're just looking for injury statistics and uh, how many folks are working at, at various installations. And uh, if, you, if you need any background on that, um, in fact, the, the kind of information you need to start with would be off of our SEMSresources.com so, site. And there it's got a copy of the October 15th Federal Register um, uh, copy of 30 CFR Part 250, and Appendix 1 there actually provides the form and instructions on how to fill it out. So yeah, that's, an, that's another public service announcement for today. Keep everybody out of trouble. Well, in that case, uh, either everybody's asleep or we've done an excellent job laying out hazards analysis. I hope everybody got something out of this that you find useful. Uh, again, it wasn't our intent to, to really tell you how to do all this stuff. That's the subject of multi-day courses, and but you can get that information uh, by looking at our free videos on the um, on the uh, outreach.html page that's on that that's on that uh, link page that I provided. Uh, that provides all the information you need on how to actually go through and implement a lot of these programs. Uh, but the key thing is understanding how all these fit together 
and how the different elements come together as part of an overall SEMS program. Anyhow, thank you for your attendance and your time.